Hello everyone. How are you all doing today? This video is to discuss chapter 1 of class 10 science course. The chapter is chemical reactions and equation. This is chapter 1 and we are going to discuss all the points that are covered in the NCRT book in detail and, and cover all the examples which are present in the NCRT book. Before we proceed with the video, I'll request you to subscribe my channel. This gives me support and also lets me know that people like liking the content. At the same time, it also keeps you informed through notifications and emails that I posted new videos covering new chapters. Okay, let's get on with this video. The first slide that we are looking at is chemical reaction. What is a chemical reaction? If we look at things that are happening around us, we'll have to look at them from the perspective or the lenses of science to define whether if something is a chemical reaction. Let us take a couple of examples. Let us suppose you have a candle. You break it into two pieces. Can we call it a chemical reaction? Think about it. If you have a pencil and you break it into two, can it be called a chemical reaction? You have a piece of paper, you tear it into two. Can it be called a chemical reaction? You cut a cake. Can it be called a chemical reaction? Think about it. Then let us say you have a glass of water and a spoon of salt. You mix salt and water. Can it be called chemical reaction? Similarly, if you try and dissolve sugar in water, can it be called chemical reaction? If you try and burn a piece of paper, can it be called a chemical reaction? So how do we define it? So to understand, a chemical reaction is basically defined by certain traits which has to happen. There are primarily four kinds of traits based on which somebody says that a chemical reaction has happened or not. Now let us look at those traits. So whenever a chemical reaction happens, there's a change in state, right? A substance changes its state from solid to liquid, from solid to gas, or liquid to gas, or liquid to solid, or something of that sort happens. It is not a mandatory requirement every time. The four traits, I would like to tell you that the four traits that I'm going to mention just now, are not mandatory. It is not that all four has to happen. Any of it can happen and any combination of it can happen. So let us look at the other thing that happens during a chemical reaction. It is a change in color happening. So you must have seen when you put iodine on starch or the starch turns blue. You must have seen it while you would have squeezed lemon on salt and iodized salt when you squeeze lemon on it the color changes to blue is it a chemical reaction yes because there's a change of color happening right similarly there's evolution of gas if you burn a piece of paper there's some gaseous substance getting produced carbon dioxide is released evolution of gas is happening Change in temperature happens. So when you mix quick lime with water, you see the water starts boiling. So there's a change in temperature happening. So any of these four things can happen during a chemical reaction, looking at which you can basically say that a activity happening is a chemical reaction or not. So if you break a piece of pencil or a wax candle or tear a piece of paper, None of these four things are happening actually. So you can comfortably say that it is not a chemical reaction, but burning of a piece of paper, uh, change of color when you squeeze lemon on iodized salt uh, is a chemical reaction. Again, uh, when you add quick lime to water to get slack lime, there's a rise in temperature. It is a chemical reaction. Change in temperature also happens when you add sulfur to water. The water heats up, it is a chemical reaction, right? So this is 
from the physical perspective things that you can physically observe basis which you can make a decision but how do we define a chemical reaction scientifically so scientifically chemical reaction is a process in which bonds between atoms and molecules get broken up and new bonds are formed between atoms and molecule to produce new kind of substances so i'll just read out what is written below during a chemical reaction atoms of one element do not change into another element that is not possible actually in a chemical reaction point to be noted in a chemical reaction one element cannot change into another just take it at a just take it literally no do atoms disappear from the mixture or appear from elsewhere in a chemical reaction right atoms cannot disappear or appear from elsewhere in a chemical reaction again take it literally actually chemical reactions involve the breaking and making of bonds between atoms to produce new substances so this is what you have to remember and if you just write this much your answer is just perfect so now let us move on to next slide so what is a chemical equation things that we just discussed in the previous slide like burning of a piece of paper uh reaction between iodine and starch those are the chemical reactions which are happening around us so how do we write it in a manner which is universal in nature and anybody irrespective of the language that they speak is able to look at it and understand how can we do that have you noticed that your mathematical formulas are universal in nature anybody and everybody speaking any kind of language can understand them. so similarly the scientific community have decided on standardization now a chemical equation is basically representation of a chemical reaction using symbols and abbreviations just like your mathematical equation right you use plus minus multiplication division all that symbols to communicate what exactly are you doing in a mathematical equation there are similar symbols used you basically use a plus and an arrow to define the direction of chemical reaction happening and also which all things are combining to produce what with substances are reactants with substances are products in a chemical reaction abbreviations are basically short representation of elements that have been defined in periodic table that you must have read in previous classes a chemical equation will always have a left hand side and a right hand side right so reactants are present on the left hand side of the equation followed by an arrow then on the right hand side we have products the point is we must balance a chemical reaction a balanced chemical equation basically means that we are ensuring that the number of atoms of all the elements which are participating in a chemical reaction on reactant side are equal to the number of same elements present on the product side of the reaction point number 6 is basically an example of a chemical equation we are looking at a chemical equation which shows formation of carbon dioxide carbon and oxygen are reacting to produce carbon dioxide we have a carbon atom which combines with oxygen molecule to give you a co2 this particular chemical equation is naturally balanced so now let us move ahead so we just discussed balancing of chemical equation here we are going to just look at definitions and the reasons for that we balance a chemical equation to ensure we are following law of conservation of mass during any reaction the total mass remains constant you must have read in your previous courses that in universe the total mass and energy always remains constant so in a chemical reaction the energy involved is very low so we don't see any transition happening from mass to energy which we see in a nuclear reaction but we only see 
change of state of matter, color of matter, rising temperature, right? So, mass of all the participating reactants will always remain same. So, we balance a chemical equation just to ensure that we are able to show and account for all the elements which are participating in the reaction. Total number of atoms of each element will be same before and after the reaction. I can stress more on this point. This is very important for you to understand. And if you really want to write a proper chemical equation, it is important that you balance it out in a proper manner. You balance, make sure that the number of atoms of each element participating in a chemical equation is same on the left hand and the right hand side. And this will get you full credits whenever whenever teacher is looking at your answers. Now, we are going to look at how to read a chemical equation. So I have given two examples here. One is basically reaction of carbon and oxygen molecule to form a carbon dioxide molecule. And second one is reaction between iron and water to produce ferric oxide and hydrogen. So how do we read it? Reading a chemical equation properly is very important. If you go to my previous slide, here you see that the reaction between carbon and oxygen, here you see that the reaction between carbon and oxygen is basically shown like this, right? It simply shows C plus O2 plus CO, which results into CO2. Now, how do you count the number of elements which are getting involved in this particular reaction? So this is what we are going to cover in this slide. How do we read it? So the black bonds that you see here, you know, the one that I've written in black fonts basically show, if you remember the previous equation, you'll see that these places are just blank. So I filled it up with one because wherever there's a blank before a molecular formula or under a particular element's abbreviation in subscript, we assume that there's a value of one there. Whatever is mentioned in the subscript under a particular abbreviation of, a, of an element is your number of atoms. Whatever is present as coefficient, which I'm highlighting now, the bigger ones, right? This basically gives you number of molecules. Okay, so here there's one molecule of carbon, one molecule of oxygen, and one molecule of carbon dioxide. So to get the number of carbon atoms, we basically multiply coefficient by the subscript for a particular element. Here also, we will multiply 1 into 2, which is equal to 2. So we know on left hand side, there are two atoms of oxygen. 1 into 1 is equal to 1. So one atom of carbon dioxide, right? On the right hand side, on the product side of the chemical equation, there is 1 multiplied by 1 for carbon. So one carbon atom and one multiplied by two for oxygen, that is two oxygen atoms. If we have to write it, we can write it like this. So we can clearly see that the number of carbon atoms is one on the left hand side. Similarly, number of carbon atom is one on the right hand side as well. Similarly, number of oxygen atoms on the left hand side is two. And similarly, there are two oxygen atoms on the right hand side as well. So this as all the you know total number of atoms are matching the individual number of atom for each element is also matching. So this is a chemically balanced equation. So let us now look at the next example where iron is reacting with water. So like in previous example wherever there was Nothing mentioned in the subscript under a particular abbreviation of an element. We assume that there is a number one. So I put a number one below iron 
I put a number one below oxygen on the reactant side. Otherwise, if you look at this formula on the product side, each element is having a subscript under it. And on the reactant side, hydrogen is having a subscript. Now, if I have to count the number of atoms of each element, I also have to know how many molecules of that particular element are present in this reaction. So, which I put with the larger coefficients which are present, which are getting highlighted now. Right? So, I assume that there is one molecule of iron, there is one molecule of water, which is H2O, there is one molecule of ferric oxide, which is Fe3O4, and there is one molecule of hydrogen. So, if I have to count the number of iron atoms on the left hand side, it is 1 multiplied by 1 is equal to 1. If I have to count the number of hydrogen atoms on the left hand side, which is on the reactant side, I will multiply 1 into 2, which is equal to 2. If I have to count the number of oxygen atoms on the reactant side on, or left hand side, it is 1 multiplied by 1 is equal to 1. Similarly, on the right hand side, number of iron atoms are 1 multiplied by 3 is equal to 3 and for oxygen it is 1 multiplied by 4 is equal to 4 and for hydrogen it is 1 multiplied by 2 is equal to 2 and we can put it like this. So in this particular case we can make it out very easily that this is not a balanced chemical equation because number of number of iron atoms because number of iron atoms on the left hand side is just one and there are three iron atoms on the right hand side even if you see there's just one deviation if just number for one particular element is different on both sides you have to know that this equation is not balanced so this is not a balanced equation so here we have covered how to read a chemical equation now in the next slide we are going to understand how do we use hit and trial method to balance a chemical equation. So now we are looking at examples of balanced chemical equation. The first example is reaction between carbon and oxygen molecules to produce carbon dioxide. We have already seen that this is a balanced, naturally balanced chemical equation. So you, you need not work on it. You can basically create a table and implement the learning from, from the previous slide as to how you count the number of atoms for each element and put it in a table like this and you can put a comment towards the right uh, mentioning that this is a balanced chemical equation right so always try to use such a table to structure your responses this will basically help the examiner understand your responses better and will help you uh, get more marks because he does not have to spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out what exactly you have written. If you tabulate your answers, be able to grasp things very quickly and know that you know the answer and you have done it. That's why you have put it in a structured manner, which is easily understandable. So we'll just move ahead and look at one more example, which is reaction between magnesium and oxygen to form magnesium oxide. Now, is this chemical equation balanced? No, it is not. Very clearly we can see on left hand side there is a oxygen atom. There are two oxygen atoms here. There is an oxygen molecule, right? But on right hand side, a molecule of magnesium oxide will have just one oxygen atom. So we need to balance this. So first we will form a table using the learnings from previous slide by putting the number of uh, atoms for each kind of element and identify what is not matching. We can very clearly see that it is not matching for oxygen. Here it is 1. On the left hand side it is 2. Right? So you have to basically use hit and trial method now to balance it out. So to balance it out, if I have to start, I will first balance out the number of oxygen atoms which are present. So I have put a 2 here as coefficient to magnesium oxide formula. So now going by our learning, if you have to calculate the number of atoms of oxygen now, so there will be 1 under oxygen 
and there's a 2s coefficient 1 multiplied by 2 is equal to 2 which is equal to the number of oxygen atoms on left left hand side so we have balanced the oxygen now while balancing it what we have done is we have made the number of atoms of magnesium as 2 as well because magnesium is also having a 1 here a subscript and 2s coefficient 2 multiplied by 1 is again 2 right so to balance out magnesium if you look out at the top magnesium is just one uh, atom which is participating right so to balance it out we'll put a 2 in front of magnesium as well so here you can see that this is your balance chemical equation just to ascertain it we are going to create one more table and look if the number of atoms for both the elements are same or not so on left hand side magnesium is 2 now on right hand side it is 2 similarly for oxygen and the total number is also matching so this is a balanced chemical equation now congratulations you have balanced one chemical equation successfully now let us look at one more example this is reaction between zinc and sulfuric acid from the look of it can you tell me if it is a balanced chemical equation? Yes, it is a ba balanced chemical equation, right? Number of zinc atoms on left hand side is 1, on right hand side is 1. 1 is coefficient, 1 is subscript, right? 1 multiplied by 1 is equal to 1 same as left hand side number of hydrogen atoms one coefficient multiplied by 2 is equal to 2 on the right hand side it is 1 multiplied by 2 is equal to 2 matching number of sulfur atoms one coefficient multiplied by 1 of sulfur subscript is equal to 1 here similarly 1 multiplied by 1 is equal to 1 for sulfur and oxygen is also 1 multiplied by 4 and on the right hand side as well it is 1 multiplied by 4 we will create our table to put it in a structured manner re-verify it once more zinc is 1 left hand side zinc is 1 right hand side hydrogen is 2 on left hand side hydrogen is 2 on right hand side sulfur is 1 on left hand side sulfur is 1 on right hand side oxygen is 4 on left hand side and oxygen is 4 on the right hand side as well so the total number of atoms participating as reactants is 8 and total number of atoms which are coming out as product is also 8 so this is also a balanced chemical equation let us look at one more example this is reaction between iron and water to form ferric oxide and hydrogen this is a reaction we saw few slides back when we are learning how to read a chemical equation is this a chemical chemically balanced equation think about it no it is not right why because there's just one atom of iron here on left hand side but there are three atoms of iron on the right hand side there's just one atom of oxygen on the left hand side there are four atoms of oxygen on the right hand side though the hydrogen number of hydrogen atoms though the number of hydrogen atoms is matching on both left hand and the right hand side but the other two elements are not matching so we form our table quickly to identify the elements on which we have to work so here there's a clear difference for iron then hydrogen is same and oxygen there's a difference total number of atoms on left hand side is different or lesser than total number of atoms on the right hand side so the equation is not balanced we'll have to balance it out right we have tried to balance it out what we have done we have basically easiest thing first iron is standing alone here we can simply match the number by because there are three atoms of three atoms of uh, iron 
will just match three in coefficient. One very important point to note is when you have to balance a chemical equation, you cannot go and add number of elements. You cannot go and add number of atoms. You'll have to add numbers in the coefficient only. So you have added a three here. So number of uh, iron atoms on left hand side and right hand side are now matching. Now we are left with oxygen which is four. It has to be, we have to match this number. So what we have done is, we have put a four as coefficient for hydrogen oxide or water molecule. So we are seeing there are four water molecules present in this particular reaction. So four multiplied by one subscript of oxygen will result into four oxygen atoms. So by putting a four here, what we have done, we have balanced out four as well. So now the number of atoms, oxygen atoms on the left hand side and the right hand side are matching. But while doing so, what we have done is, we have put a four as coefficient to hydrogen as well. So the number of hydrogen atoms have increased from just two to eight. How do we balance it? We add another four in front of hydrogen as coefficient and we balance it out. Now let us quickly put our table together just to make sure that we have done it right. Yes. So now the number of atoms of iron on the left hand side is same as number of at iron atoms on the right hand side. Similarly for hydrogen atoms and for oxygen atoms. And the total number of atoms on both the sides is also same, right? So now we can safely say that the chemical equation is balanced. So now we are done with balancing of chemical equations. I would request you all to go back, uh, practice and make sure that you at least understand and remember all the examples which I have just shown you because these are present in the NCRT book and has a high probability of coming in the exam. You must practice as, as much as possible. Try out your learning with different uh, chemical equations and basically make sure that you're able to easily grasp it. As soon as you look at a chemical equation, you should be able to grasp whether it is balanced or not. That is first step. Then you should be able to identify which of elements are not uh, balanced. And then you should have some sense of using hit and trial method, which will only come through practice. So you should go and practice a little bit more for this particular topic. So now we'll move on to next slide. So now we are looking at writing a chemical equation. Writing a chemical equation, as we have discussed before, that we try and input phase details about chemical reactions using abbreviations and symbols. But with the abbreviations and symbols, we are only able to tell which are the participating elements. And symbol basically tells us the direction of a chemical reaction which is happening. So how do you provide more information about the chemical reaction? as to what is the state of the reactants, what is the state of the product which is coming out of the reaction, what are the conditions under which that reaction is getting triggered. For example, formation of carbon dioxide in which carbon and oxygen combines to form carbon dioxide is always triggered by heat. So you basically try and include these informations in the chemical equation to make it more rich and more informative. So let us look at a couple of things. Uh, the first point is to make a chemical equation more informative, we include the state of each, each react. This is something that I just mentioned. State mentioned are basically four. Solid, aqueous, liquid and gas. Solid, we all are very clear what do we call a solid. Liquid, we all are very clear what do we call a liquid and gas also we are very clear as to what is called a gaseous state. Aqueous state is a state in which a solid is dissolved into a liquid. So salt 
which is sodium chloride dissolved into water will be a aqueous solution got it now the next point that we have to look at is example of equation with states of reactant uh, again this is a reaction that we have seen so many times uh, since we have started this video uh, iron reacting with water to form ferric oxide and hydrogen if you look at the reaction carefully you'll see that i have mentioned s uh, in front of iron on the left hand side which basically denotes that it is a solid state react then in front of water molecule i have put it as g which means the water molecule is as participating in form of gas so here in this particular case what we are doing is we are using steam so which is a gaseous state of water for the reaction hence we are mentioning water is g otherwise it will be l which is liquid and then ferric oxide is formed which again is a solid state and then hydrogen is released which is in gaseous state sometimes the condition of reaction is also used we basically try and tell like i said whether it is a heat treatment or some other information which can basically tell us about how a reaction is happening and under what environment let us look at a couple of examples we are seeing this particular example in which carbon monoxide is reacting with hydrogen atom to form methanol and this is happening under a pressure of 340 atmosphere so this is a very informative chemical equation you can see all the states of all the participating reactants and products are mentioned uh the condition under which this particular reaction is happening is also mentioned so we can say that this particular chemical equation is in itself complete another example when we are looking at reaction in which a plant consumes carbon dioxide and uses water to form glucose and release oxygen into the air and water right so uh here what we are seeing is i'll just use a highlighter here um all right so we are seeing that carbon dioxide six molecule of carbon dioxide in aqueous state which is these molecules are dissolved in water when they are present and about to react with 12 molecules of water which is in liquid state inside a plant and when i say inside a plant i am meaning it is happening somewhere on the leaf because photosynthesis sub is something which happens on the leaf the second example is a, is an example of photosynthesis that's why we see that sunlight is essential and chlorophyll is a catalyst which is making this reaction happen and what we get as a result is what we get as a result is glucose So C six H twelve O six in aqueous solution is formula of glucose. And while this reaction happens, the plant releases six molecules of oxygen and six molecules of water. So this is the reaction for photosynthesis. So remember this. You might be asked write down the chemical equation. for formation of glucose this is the the second example that we saw is what you have to write it might be asked write the reaction of photosynthesis it, the same answer has to be used they might also ask you for chemical equation for reaction of carbon molecules with water in presence of sunlight and aided by chlorophyll so keep in mind all these variants which might just come for this particular equation that you saw just now okay now moving on to next slide so now we are going to discuss type of chemical reactions so right at the start of video we looked at couple of examples we discussed burning of paper melting of ice adding iodine to starch to get blue color 
right? So they were all chemical reactions. But can we really classify or say that burning of paper is same as melting of an ice cube? Or is it same as adding iodine to a starch? No, right? So scientific community has created broad classification basis. Some of the chemical reaction traits basis with a chemical reaction can be classified and said it, it is this kind of chemical reaction or that kind of chemical reaction. So right now on this slide, we are going to look at all those kind of classifications under which we can classify almost all the chemical reactions happening in this world. Other than thermonuclear, of course, only the chemical reactions I'm talking about here. So the first type is a combination reaction. As the name suggests, the name is self-explanatory. A combination reaction is a case where two simpler compounds or elements combine to form a more or a higher complex compound, right? Then the next type is decomposition reaction. Again, the name explains it all. What happens when something decomposes? It basically breaks down, right? So decomposition of leaf, decomposition of vegetables that you eat is basically breaking down of that particular thing. So in decomposition reaction, a higher or complex compound breaks into simpler compounds, right? Now let us look at the next chemical reaction, displacement reaction. So displacement reaction, again, as the name suggests, is a reaction in which something is getting displaced, right? What usually happens, a more reactive element replaces a lesser reactive element from a compound. We are going to look at a couple of examples as we move ahead in this video. Now, double displacement reaction. As the name suggests, it is displacement is happening twice. We have just understood displacement reaction, a highly reactive or a more reactive element replaces a lesser reactive element from a compound. Now, what if the two participating elements out of equal, like they are equally reactive? What happens in that case, right? So if one replaces another, then the another is going to replace the first one. So that is double dis displacement reaction. We are going to look at a couple of examples uh, going ahead. Then oxidation and reduction reaction. These are probably the most important reactions uh, happening around us. And uh, it is also very important from your course's perspective. And you will be able to look at any reaction and uh, you will be able to say that it is oxidation or reduction reaction. So there are certain traits of oxidation and reduction reaction. Oxidation, as the name suggests, it is a process in which oxygen is getting added. Right? So carbon plus oxygen molecule becomes carbon dioxide. So this particular thing is oxidation of carbon. And what is a reduction reaction? It is right opposite of oxidation. What is that? It is oxidation was addition of oxygen. Reduction will be removal of oxygen. Right? And also oxidation reaction is defined from the perspective of hydrogen element as well. So in oxidation, Oxygen gets added to an element or a hydrogen element or a hydrogen atom is removed from a compound. So hydrogen will be right opposite of what is happening with oxygen for oxidation and reduction. So in reduction, we say that it is removal of a oxygen atom. Then from hydrogen's perspective, it will become, it will be addition of a hydrogen atom to a compound. So in oxidation, from oxygen's perspective, it is addition of oxygen. From hydrogen's perspective, it is re removal of hydrogen. From re for reduction reaction, it is removal of oxygen. And from hydrogen's perspective, it is addition of hydrogen. Got it? Just remember these. They are going to help you going forward as we move ahead in this video, just 
try and link everything from oxidation oxidation is addition of oxygen hydrogen will be right opposite of that which is removal of hydrogen for oxidation for reduction reduction is opposite of oxidation so removal of oxygen and addition of hydrogen just remember that this is going to help you a lot going forward again we are just discussing that melting of ice happens right how does it melts it a uh, ice cube absorbs temperature from ambient surrounding the surrounding which is around it absorbs it absorbs that energy and melts it right and becomes water similarly when you burn a piece of paper it releases heat so that is also a classification which is added along with the five kind of classifications that we have just discussed so a reaction in which energy is released is called exothermic reaction your burning of paper is exothermic reaction second category is reaction in which energy is absorbed it is called endothermic reaction melting of ice cube we just discussed it and the third kind is in which precipitate is formed is called precipitation reaction right so what is a precipitate if a compound or a, or an element is present in an ambient environment and is completely dissolved is mixed right and somehow something happens because of which it coagulates it basically separates from the ambient environment and becomes an entity of its own which doesn't dissolves back into the ambient environment it is called precipitation your rain is an example of precipitation what happens the water vapor which rises and becomes cloud remains as cloud for a long time and remains up there but when it reaches certain critical temperature and certain critical height that particular temperature and height or reduction in pressure triggers precipitation of water vapor to coagulate and become larger molecules or larger substances together and which is called precipitate and then that water cannot dissolve back into the air in form of vapor and it falls down so that is precipitation for you second example can be when you add lemon to milk what happens you get your paneer or you get your cottage cheese right that is also a precipitation happening what happens the milk protein separates out from water and becomes insoluble it doesn't dissolves back into the ambient environment which is around so you are able to easily filter out the paneer or the cottage cheese for your consumption and leave out the water so this separation of milk protein from water content in the milk is called precipitation reaction so let us move ahead now now we are going to look at examples of combination reaction we just saw the classifications of chemical reaction so we'll one by one go through all the examples combination reaction two or more reactants combine to form a single product in these reactions mostly heat is released so they are generally exothermic in nature an example can be reaction of calcium oxide with water to form calcium hydroxide calcium hydroxide is also known as slack line which is used for white washing the walls so this is the formula if you have not seen it please go to the market buy a little amount of quick lime so your calcium oxide is also called quick lime and get small amount of quick lime try and add it to water the water and the quick lime proportion should be water should be about 3 to 4 times of whatever amount the quick lime is you'll see that extreme amount of heat is released when you add quick lime to water so you technically hydrate calcium oxide and as a result you get slack lime which is used for white washing the formula is caoh whole twice right 
for your information the caoh hole twice which is your slack line or calcium hydroxide when you apply it on the wall it basically reacts with the carbon dioxide which is present in the atmosphere to form calcium carbonate that's why after couple of days of whitewashing a wall you find that the wall has got more shine to it a fresh whitewash looks a little dull but a whitewash which is about 2 to 3 days old shines much more than a freshly whitewashed wall why because the calcium carbonate is basically the same material as your marble and we all know marbles shines a lot right so the formula for marble is cacio3 and and when calcium hydroxide reacts with carbon dioxide in atmosphere it also results into calcium carbonate which is cacio3 so you are technically applying a very thin film of marble on your wall and as a result you get very good shine from any whitewash that you do so here is what i was just mentioning this is the formula what happens to the water which gets released in the process it gets released as liquid right so what happens is this water dries up due to temperature in the surrounding or due to arid air which is around that wall or wherever you have applied the whitewash so water just evaporates as vapor leaving by leaving behind cacio3 which is your calcium carbonate slash your limestone slash the marble let's look at couple of more examples for combination reaction burning of coal is an example of combination reaction it is exothermic in nature you know coal is burned to generate heat and is used in power plants so burning of coal is an example of a combination reaction carbon and oxygen molecules combine to form carbon dioxide and in turn heat is also released formation of water this is also an exothermic reaction hydrogen and oxygen molecules combine together to form water molecules next is burning of natural gas methane combining with oxygen so whenever i say combining with oxygen it basically means that the first reactant is getting oxidized so methane getting oxidized oxidized by oxygen molecule to form carbon dioxide and water now couple of slides back we discuss formation of glucose in plants leaves where carbon dioxide molecules and water molecules react in presence of chlorophyll and sunlight to form glucose and oxygen and water right so what happens when you eat a plant that glucose is broken down by our body to release energy that we use for a day to day work that which basically keeps us alive so this is the formula that you have to look at please make a note of it this is a very important formula and might just come in your exams breaking down or oxidation of glucose in human body c6h12o6 in aqueous form gets oxidized by six molecules of oxygen in aqueous form and carbon dioxide is released plus water is re released plus energy is released the carbon dioxide that is released in this process or reaction is what we breathe out so this is the reason why we breathe out carbon dioxide now going to next slide which is decomposition reaction what it is single reactant breaks down to give simpler product. Now let us look at example. 
decomposition of ferrous sulfate crystals. Here we have seen that ferrous sulfate crystal is the FeSO4 is ferrous sulfate dot 7H2O. 7H2 signifies that if ferrous sulfate is left out in ambient environment, it will absorb 7 molecules of water per molecule of ferrous sulfate to hydrate itself. Right? So, if you look at the reaction, the first reaction, the first thing that you see is ferrous sulfate, hydrated ferrous sulfate. The color of hydrated ferrous sulfate will be bluish green. It is a very beautiful color. So if you have to remove water from ferrous sulfate, you heat it. You take it in a test tube and start heating as ferrous sulfate loses water. Its color changes to gray, right? And then again, if you keep heating, ferrous sulfate decomposes into ferric oxide which is Fe2O3, which is a solid and sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide, which are gases. Now, let us take a look at another example, which is decomposition of calcium carbonate, which is limestone or marble, right, to get calcium oxide. We just discussed the reaction of calcium oxide, the lime. When we add it to water, it gives us slack lime or calcium hydroxide and when we use that for whitewashing after a couple of days what happens the slack lime reacts with the carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere and forms a thin layer of calcium carbonate which gives an excellent white and bright color on the surfaces which are whitewashed now have you ever thought how do we get calcium oxides in the market Calcium oxide is in turn generated from calcium carbonate itself. Calcium carbonate or limestone or marble are queried from different mines and then it is treated or it is reduced by implementing heat and it is reduced to calcium oxide. Now let us look at cal the chemical reaction for the same. This is the chemical reaction. Calcium carbonate is heated and it releases calcium oxide which is your quicklime and carbon dioxide which is in gaseous state. Now this quicklime is taken to the market distributed all across which in turn is bought by people. They hydrate it, they put it in water to get slack lime or calcium hydroxide, use it for whitewash which in turn again cut allows reaction between calcium hydroxide and carbon dioxide which is present in the air and in turns it again turns back to calcium carbonate isn't it excellent and interesting isn't it interesting to know that the reaction for calcium carbonate is almost a cyclical reaction it starts from calcium carbonate and then again it ends as a calcium carbonate though in a different form or let us say when it is queried, it is more solid, it has bigger pieces of rock. But when it finally converts into calcium carbonate on walls, it is more like a film, very thin film on the wall or in form of powder. So that's the beauty of science. So now let us look at examples. Decomposition of lead nitrate. Please make sure that you are noting down all these chemical equations and you know these chemical equations by heart because it can be asked in your exams. Here we see that lead nitrates when heated results into product which is lead oxide and four molecules of nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. Similarly, similarly, similarly decomposition of silver chloride in presence of sunlight decomposition of silver bromide again in presence of sunlight so decomposition reaction which is carried out by application of heat is called thermal decomposition just remember this okay now let us move ahead
Decomposition reaction needs energy in form of heat, light, or electricity to break the reactants. Reaction in which energy is absorbed is called endothermic reaction. So we can safely assume that almost a very high percentage of your decomposition reaction are endothermic in nature. Now let us look at displacement reaction. Iron displacing copper from copper sulfate solution is a classic example. Iron is more reactive than copper. It replaces copper from copper sulfate and copper precipitate and copper precipitates as a solid in the solution. Similarly, zinc replacing copper. Lead displacing copper in copper chloride. Please note down all these chemical equations. They are very important and might just be asked in exam. Uh, you might be asked for two or three examples of displacement reactions. Uh, you need not remember or just mug up whatever is written here. Try to understand it. How is it happening? Why is it happening? And you'll be able to just put it uh, out on the paper without any effort. So, the more reactive elements replace the less reactive elements in displacement reaction. Double displacement reaction, the interesting bit. Now let us look at a couple of examples. Here, sodium sulfate is reacting with barium chloride. In turn, we get barium sulfate and sodium chloride. So, in double displacement reaction, there is an exchange of ions happening between two reactants. Now, oxidation and reduction reaction. We have discussed this in detail right a uh, couple of slides back. So, when you heat copper powder, it turns black due to oxidation as oxygen is added to it and, and it forms copper oxide which results in black color. Right? So, this is the formula for oxidation of copper. Now, if you pass hydrogen over hot copper oxide, it is reduced and we get copper back. This is reduction reaction. So just remember it that carbon, that copper. So please remember it that copper gets oxidized when it is heated it forms copper oxide and when you pass hydrogen over it, it gets reduced as the hydrogen takes away the oxygen from copper and water is formed and copper is left out and copper reduces back from copper oxide to copper. Oxidation reduction reaction is also called redox reaction. This is a visual presentation of what is happening in form of oxidation and reduction. You have to Remember these points in oxidation, a substance will either gain oxygen or lose hydrogen, right? So in the first example that we see, copper is gaining oxygen, so it is oxygen. Copper is gaining oxygen, that's why it is oxidation and zinc is losing oxygen because of which it is reduction. In the second example, we are seeing that hydrochloric acid, chlorine is losing hydrogen. That is why it is oxidation. And manganese is losing oxygen. That is why it is reduction. Okay. So just remember these points. Oxidation gains oxygen or lose hydrogen and reduction a substance will lose oxygen or gain hydrogen it is easy to remember just your hook your mental hook should be around the word oxidation and from there you will be able to drive all the relations what are the common examples that we see in daily life for oxidation and reduction corrosion the common example that we see of oxidation is corrosion. When you leave a piece of iron outside, you see that it gets rusted after some time. 
So what is happening? Iron is getting oxidized there in presence of water, right? And rancidity, again, when your food becomes sour, that is also a case where oxidation is happening. So that is all. Uh, we have covered the entire chapter. We, we have learned what are chemical reactions, what are chemical equations, how to read chemical equation. We have also learned uh, how to balance chemical equation. We have learned different classifications of chemical reactions. We have learned what are endothermic, exothermic and precipitating reactions. We have looked at various examples. I just hope that you guys work a bit harder. Look at more examples. Practice balancing of equations. Uh, try and remember all the examples which are present in these slides. Because these are very important examples and might just come in your exams. And hope that you do well in your exams. Uh, looking at these, watching these videos. Do subscribe to the channel. It will also help you get notification about the new videos which are coming up. Also, um, do leave a comment uh, under the video to let me know as to which all points need further detailed coverage so that I can do something about it and create a new video and post it for your reference. And do hit the like or the dislike button. That is a good needle for me to understand uh, whether these videos are of help to you guys or not. So thank you for your time and have a good day. Bye.